Hi, everyone. Uh, this is the Happiness Room at Haskell Love 2021. This is the last talk for the morning session in this track, although it's uh, evening here in Singapore. Uh, our next speaker has a fascinating variety of interests, fashion, AI, quantum computing, creative programming, and functional programming. He has even combined all of those interests to design pretty t-shirts programmatically. You'll be seeing him wearing one uh, on stream today. So to give us a taste of a future where we can use Haskell and quantum computing, I welcome Noon van der Silk. Uh, a quick word about Q&A. Uh, Noon, Noon has, a, the talk is in two sections, so we'll have an interlude where we can, ask, uh, where we can have a Q&A. So please feel free to post all your questions on Discord. All right, Noon, you can take over now. Cool, thanks. Uh, and thanks for having me here. And I, yeah, I just really want to thank the Haskell Love team for uh, accepting my talk. I also want to thank um, just, there's a lot of people that have helped me out in the community to get me to this point. So I just want to say thanks to all the kind of Haskell meetup group in Melbourne and just lots of colleagues and uh, current colleagues and former colleagues that have helped me out. So I just want to say thanks to them. So, yeah, we're going to talk about quantum computing and Haskell. Um, and we're going to proceed in the following way. So we're going to kind of construct this little story. We're going to look at, you know, this kind of linear part, the quantum part. We're going to combine them together and basically see how they get along. Um, so I just want to give you like a little bit of context for how this story is going to go. So I'm going to kind of relate quantum computing uh, and type theory through this idea of copying. We're going to try and learn enough about quantum computing to be what I would call dangerous. So this is like, we might not know the proofs of everything, we'll at least be able to talk to people or kind of understand them. <clears throat> and basically, the one thing I want you to get out of this is to hopefully be a little bit excited about just the intersection of these two things to do your own research or, or whatever. Um, so my focus is going to be on what I call uh, practical quantum computing. OK, and so this gold thing in the middle of this picture here is a quantum computer. But of interest is the fact that there are actually other things around this computer. OK, there's a person who clearly cares about how she's going to interact with this thing. And down in the bottom left is there's kind of what you might call control hardware, OK? So we might think about all these ideas together when we think about programming a computer. Um, so let's meet what I'm calling our linear love interest, multiplicity. So the context is this. Let's suppose we have an idea for a function, right? It's a little bit contrived, of course, but it's going to be kind of like an identity function for integers, OK? There's one correct implementation, pretty good, not bad. There's actually others though. So I could also do this and I could also do this. These would both compile, okay? But it's a little bit annoying because maybe some of these feel wrong, right? So what's happened? Like how come we can have these implementations that feel wrong? The issue is basically the implementation matches the type of the function, my identity, but it doesn't match what we intended, OK? So we really want to work out how can we encode our intention in the type, OK? So linear types are one way of kind of making a bit more progress in that space. So they were merged a while back. This is on the Twig blog back in 2020, last year. Um, and the new idea is basically this little I believe they call it like a multiplicity annotation. And so what it talks, this little thing in the purple uh, circle there, the percent one, okay? So what this does is it basically says, hey, when you receive this X parameter, you are required to use it precisely once or precisely one times, okay? And this is kind of exciting because it makes these two uh, implementations actually wrong. Right, this is great. So we get this um, type error, which basically says, hey, the multiplicity of this thing is wrong. You, you promised it would be one, but you've actually used it twice. OK, this is great. We love this. Now, classic little bit of technical detail. 
that you might need to understand a part of this talk, which is that actually sometimes we might have a linear function that wants to kind of return an argument that doesn't have this linear constraint on it. Okay, so I'm not going to get into too much of the details about how uh, the linear type system is implemented. My understanding is actually surprisingly complicated, but the kind of the thing that demonstrates the idea here is really this uh, linear kind of file API. Okay, so without understanding too much of the notation, the point is like maybe you want to work with file handles linearly, right? But if you get a string from the file, that feels like something you can use as many times as you like, right? You might want to print it several times. Okay, so they use this idea of unrestricted to represent this concept. And just because there's a little bit of a mismatch between um, the syntax in the paper and the syntax in Haskell, this is what this kind of thing would look like. So there's this little UR um, type, okay? So um, what I just want to show you is like, well, of course, there's like many, so my, the, my identity function is not all we can do. We actually do quite a lot of cool things. Um, some of them you can find here, but actually there's, there's like a growing world of cool things you can do with linear types. So um, take a look uh, if you're interested. Okay, great. That was a little bit of an overview of linear types. So now what we're going to do is meet um, our, what I'm calling our quantum co-star. Okay, the, this little tidbits of information about quantum computing or tid qubits. Forgive my terrible jokes, please. There will be many more of them. Um, so I just want to introduce you to a little bit of notation about quantum computing. I think it's okay if you don't get all of this in the first go. There's certainly not going to be a test, but um, I just want you to get used to the feel. Okay, so we can have what we call a qubit. And it can be uh, a combination of what we might consider to be zero and one. So I think they call this a ket, ket of zero, ket of one. A and B are just complex numbers. So it occurs to me at this present second, not everyone might have seen complex numbers before. But um, in physics, people, well, and in maths, frankly, people, one day someone was like, what is the square root of negative one? And then someone said, I don't know, maybe we make that equal to i, and then I hope it's equal to i. And then um, they went about their, their kind of mathematician business and a whole rich world opened up, okay? So um, if you don't know what a complex number is, it's not too important at the moment. So th what is important is there's this kind of normalization constraint on a qubit. And so I can just write down an example of a qubit for you here. And here you can see that a and b are both equal to one over square root two, okay? And actually a very important concept is the idea of uh, uh, taking and considering multiple qubits together, okay? So in this case, what we're gonna do is we're gonna have A, who's gonna have a qubit in the zero state. We're gonna have B, who's gonna have a qubit in the one state. And A and B are gonna wanna combine their qubits together. And the way they do this notationally is with this uh, so-called tensor product. And so what you do is you just write a's qubit next to b's qubit. And then because um, you know we want to save uh, horizontal space, we can just eliminate the tensor product and just assume, like define this kind of more concise notation to mean this thing on the left. Okay, I certainly haven't explained what the tensor product is. I'm gonna do that in the next slide somewhat. What I'm getting used to here, hopefully, is the notation. Okay. So, um, yeah, and just, just observation, we're trying to fill in this sentence. So hopefully, we're going to kind of have some feeling about what this sentence that at this point is probably full of jargon uh, might mean. Okay. So one thing to think about now is like, well, how would we represent these qubits? Uh, on a computer, right? If we want to kind of think about them and do maths with them, let's say. So one uh, standard representation is to, I think 
they might even call this the Heisenberg representation. Uh, maybe the physicists will get upset with me if I got that wrong. I'm sure I'll be corrected. Um, where what I can do is I can define zero, define zero, sorry, to be this vector. And I can define one to be this vector. Okay. And then this tensor product thing, if we were to take the tensor product of uh, zero and one represented here by kind of arbitrary complex numbers, X and Y, U and V, um, there's a way of combining these to, to produce a larger vector. Okay, the, the details of that aren't particularly important. But what is quite important when it comes to this idea of measurement is picking what they call in uh, linear algebra a basis. And a basis of a vector space is just any set probably of orthogonal vectors, meaning they don't overlap with each other, um, that can be combined together with addition to, uh, to kind of be equal to any other vector that's possible to exist in that space. Um, again, it's not massively important that you remember that, but what is important is to remember that this idea of a basis in quantum computing is quite crucial. And actually there's more than one, okay? For if you take a, a system of any particular size, there's more than one basis. Um, what I'm showing you here is a basis for the one qubit case. That's this first one here with the zero and one vectors. And more generally, I've got a, a, a vector, uh, sorry, a basis for two qubits. Okay, and what you should notice here is that the way you write down the basis elements in this, in what in quantum computing we call the computational basis, is you just kind of write down these bit strings, like zero, 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 one, one, zero, one, one, for however many qubits you have. And that's how you enumerate this so-called standard basis. Okay, so this extra structure in a Hilbert space that really isn't important for our talk, but if you're curious, you can investigate that. Um, so here comes a key idea, which is like, well, how do we manipulate these, um, these kind of quantum variables, right? Well, we kind of know how to manipulate classical Boolean variables. Okay, we can take, we can do Boolean logic on them. Question is, is there kind of like a quantum logic that we can use for these quantum gates? Uh, the answer is yes, of course. Otherwise we wouldn't be able to do very much. Um, so the way you do it is you have these so-called unitary operations. Okay. Um, and what they, they there's a, so this is, you'll see in a moment that the, we can interpret these as matrices, you know, kind of representation. And one of the first con constraints on them is that they should be reversible in some sense. That's what this constraint says. Okay, it says if you apply U and then what is essentially the inverse of U, that should be the same as doing nothing. Okay, so this is what kind of correlates with the idea that quantum mechanics is, is, is reversible. And this one is a little bit more complicated to give the kind of physical intuition for, but what it shows you here is that U kind of distributes over addition. Okay, so if I have a state that's made up of psi plus phi, um, well, I can just kind of stick U, I can just kind of uh, distribute U across plus and consider the term separately. Okay, this is um, very, very important. And so I just want to give you a little bit of an example now of some unitary gates that we can apply to qubits. The first one is what they call the not gate. We'll see this why this is the not gate in a moment. And another one that's very important is the Hadamard gate. I'm not going to go into too many details about that again just now, but it's useful to know that it exists. So here's an example showing why we consider the X gate, the not gate, okay? If I take X and apply it to zero, then I can expand that out in the matrix form that we just learned about. And I can see that it equals one. 
And from this reversibility constraint of x, we know that x applied to one will give back zero. Okay, so it's a pretty um, reasonable thing to be calling the not operation. Um, and the last kind of essential concept is, is of quantum measurement. And so what this says is like, well, if I've got a given state, if I've got some particular state um, and I pick some particular basis in the physics land, they call these observables. Like you wanna observe something about this, this state that's in a potential superposition. So this, this term up here, it's, it's potentially in a super, what they call a superposition of zero and one. Well, there's a rule for kind of reading it off. If your state is written like this, you can basically say, okay, well, the probability of this uh, state psi being in the zero is just the, the absolute value of a squared and likewise for it being in the state one, okay? And so we can do an example of this with our qubit that we saw earlier. We can just kind of read this off here and observe that, okay, well, what's the probability if we were to measure this in the um, standard basis, the basis that we picked there, that it would be zero, well, it's going to be a half, and then likewise for a one. Okay. Um, and this really, this next example is actually pretty important. Um, it's just important to kind of remember because we're going to refer back to it. So there's another quantum state that we can have called the Bell state. Actually, this four Bell states, this is one of them. Um, but we're gonna do something a bit different this time. We're gonna measure only the first qubit, only this qubit A. Okay, this is something that's possible to do. And in this particular instance, what will happen, you're gonna kind of have to believe me here, I haven't shown you all the, the maths for this necessarily. But when I measure qubit A, if you just look at this term, if I find it in the zero state, the only other possibility is that B is in the zero state because there's no other term in this equation that has some component where A is zero. Okay, likewise for finding it in the one state. If I find it in the one state, I know that B is gonna be in the one state. Okay. Um, this, this, this is very interesting. What we've learned is that the outcomes are correlated. Um, Okay, this idea of correlation is very important. Maybe some of you are thinking like, well, you know, if I just have kind of probabilistic variables, it's certainly possible for them to be correlated as well. Um, that's true. So all I've kind of shown you here is, is how the examples are correlated. It, it would be a little bit more work to demonstrate how this is an, uh, an instance of entanglement, but the Bell state is an example of an entangled state. Okay, so I just kind of want to sneak in an example of entanglement here because it's very, very important. Um, so we'll come back to this idea of entanglement. Um, okay, so now we've met our two, uh, our two uh, people that are starring in a story <laughs> that I've constructed. Uh, let's suppose they meet, right? The no cloning theorem is kind of hurrying off to work uh, and bumps into, um, linear types, <laughs> okay? So I need to explain to you what the no cloning theorem is, of course, which is what I'm gonna do now. So the no cloning theorem says the following. It basically says an unknown state of a qubit can't be copied. Okay, so one way of expressing this in our notation is to say that, well, imagine, suppose for a moment that we had a U such that when we apply it on psi of zero, psi combined with zero, we would get psi combined with psi. Okay, that would be great, right? We've just managed to copy psi to this other kind of empty qubit. Um, no cloning theorem says no, can't do that. Okay, uh, the proof is actually, I would try and argue that you could do it from the what you've seen in the slide so far. You don't have to try, as I said, it's not gonna be a test, <laughs> but the connection to make here, the connection between these two things is that if I had this function clone, then I could do this thing, okay? Um, that would be great, uh, but I guess the, the, the happiness that we're going to achieve here is that 
uh, linear types rules this out. Okay. Now at this point, you could make an observation if you wished. Um, your observation would be noon. If nature um, is never going to allow no cloning, like if quantum mechanics says no cloning is just flat out not possible. Okay, why do I need my type system to worry about that? It's not like it's gonna cause a black hole that will kind of collapse um, my house and everything around it. Um, sh should I be sad? And, and I would argue actually, no, it's okay. Like we don't have to be sad just yet, right? At least not for that reason. Um, one of the reasons is like, we're still trying to do this thing of representing our intention in our types, okay? So that's like still our dream. Um, maybe that's part of our dream using Haskell in general. Okay, so love is back on. Um, so I'm gonna pause for some questions, but while we maybe see if there's any questions, I'll also allow you to consider a joke. Um, so I'll take questions now if there are any. Yeah, I, I missed the switch. Uh, I couldn't note down like a page number or anything. It was in act two uh, where you had like 0 0.1, 0 0.2 or something like that. Uh, so the question is what does 0.2 have to do with time independence? Yes, good question. Roughly the idea is basically like, Note that X and H here, they don't vary. There's no parameter to X and H. Okay, so they don't change um, X and H themselves. I think that's the gist. Happy to chat more about that later. Have to, have to be honest, only learned that uh, relationship a couple of days ago and I was up late last night staring at the computer trying to work it out. <laughs> um, but that's my understanding so far. Uh, any other questions while I just get back? Uh, to there's one more. I think you've already ans answered this, uh, but is the no cloning theorem really a theorem in the mathematical sense, or is it a statement of a physical law? Um, could be both. <laughs> it's certainly a theorem in the mathematical sense. And I would argue that is also a statement about physical reality. Um, has anyone guessed the answer to the joke? Uh, so far, nobody. Great, get ready for the answer, which is the no cloning theorem, of course, cloning crucial part of working with GitHub. So I just want to take like a, continue this brief interlude where we're observing to note that there's actually quite been quite a lot of work in the quantum programming language community. It might've even been kicked off with, with Quipper. Um, so a lot of this talk is gonna kind of use a bit of stuff from Quipper. And actually I just want to point, I think this paper is from 2013 or 2011 or something. Um, and I just want to highlight the part that's in red, which was said, which roughly says, hey, life would be really good if we could have a linear type system. Okay, so um, here we are. Very exciting, life is good. Um, there's other fun ways to kind of think about quantum algorithms and kind of writing them down. There's some kind of so-called diagrammatic ways. One of them is called the ZX calculus. Uh, and there's another one, that, that came out recently that you can check out kind of relating these so-called symmetric monoidal categories. Um, the ZX calculus does the same thing. Um, there's also what people might call a quantum assembly language. Okay, so this it should in principle be some kind of language that every quantum processor knows how to interpret um, and understand. Okay, I'd say we're <laughs> moderately far from that being true but this is an open standard to kind of make that more likely. There's of course a Python API for doing, um, for working with what we call quantum circuits or these quantum algorithms that we're hopefully gonna see. Um, and yeah, there's of course been a lot of work by Microsoft so that they've got a really nice uh, language called Q Sharp, um, which has got I think probably quite a few interesting type features so worth worth checking out. Um, and there's another one, there's a kind of another ecosystem called Quill and Quill we might kind of come back, we might talk about a little bit, at least in this idea of like what people call quantum compilation. Okay, so I might talk about quantum compilation at some point or you can just ask me about it. Okay, so let's now try and take a look. Let's go back to our story and try and take a look at what, um, it's like for our two characters, how do they enjoy spending their time together? So one thing we could do taking what we've learned 
yeah, ba namely that linear types helps us enforce these usage constraints, which the no cloning theorem requires, okay, is we could define a little linear API. Um, here's how one might do it. So the H function here represents the Hadamard gate, the X represents the um, uh, not gate, and the C operation represents a um, higher level operation you maybe can kind of think of it as like a quantum if statement. Okay. Um, and so this kind this C not here says something like, well, if uh, something is true, then do the X gate on, on another on another qubit. Okay. And so how do we get qubits? How do we work with qubits? Well, this would be very by analogy to the file API. Okay, so we can have some way to kind of start up qubits, we can have some way to spin them down, and we can have some way to measure them. Um, and then we can write a nice little algorithm that constructs this bell state. Okay, looks kind of cool. Um, and I just want to now, if you will allow it, is to do a little bit of live coding to just kind of show you what these um, what these errors look like. Okay, so I'll post a link to this code, it's all open. Um, but let's just jump into the code here and have a look at example one. And I'll open up my little REPL here. Hopefully everything compiles, it does. But what I can see is like, sorry, I'll make that a little bit bigger. Hopefully that's big enough. So the observation here is the following. If I simply do nothing, this example as is, is good. If I, and just to clarify what we're doing, we're allocating a qubit and then just returning it back to whoever called us. That seems pretty useful. Okay, what if we allocate two qubits, but forget to return the other one? Type error, okay? What it basically says is, hey, you have made a promise about what you would do with B. Um, forgive the hard to read error there, but it's just this multiplicity error again. It says you didn't do enough with B. You said you'd do something with it, okay? So that's bad. So what we could do is we could just allocate it and then shut it down, which is fine again. So that's one example. I'll just show you another example of what working with this API looks like. I think I can do that. Um, so now this time we have two qubits. We've applied some particular operation to them. That's fine. And then what the good part is like, well, let's use those two qubits in a C naught operation. Okay, let's apply the C naught um, in this in this way and get back some qubits. That seems that seems okay. Okay, that works. But what if we accidentally use the A qubit twice? Type error. Okay, very exciting. We actually get two type errors. Okay, so we've upset the um, compiler in two ways this time, but that's still uh, great. So that's that's it. I just wanted to kind of give you a feel for what the type errors look like and kind of uh, prove that maybe this little API is not a total lie. Um, so now let's have a think. Like, is this perfect relationship now, right? Are these two, do, are these two is quantum computing and linear types going to have a great time? Life be perfect? Unfortunately, the, the answer is no. Right? Um, so at least one of the reasons, there's probably many reasons. One of them is the computational model that we have here is a bit problematic. But one way to think about this is, let's have our picture of our uh, lab and a little kind of schematic of our lab. Okay? And let's have this kind of function that we wanna think about running here. So in this lab, there's actually lots of different hardware. So. Um, there's been a talk already about Clash talking about clock speeds and so on. So that's really relevant here. So the QPU, the quantum processor, interacts with these other kind of faster devices, the FPGAs, um, but maybe it doesn't even interact with the CPU at all. Maybe the CPU is too slow. Okay, so the way we've defined our API, um, you, you would, so Rio here, in case I hadn't explained it, is kind of just like the linear um, linear version of the I/O monad, if you will. Um, it kind of implies that we're running these functions immediately, right? Like, or in other words, that the CPU is directly connected to the QPU. Actually, that's not the case. 
Okay. So I just kind of want to, at this point, want to make this argument that a simple uh, little DSL for quantum languages actually doesn't even help with this problem at all. We actually need to intermingle what you might call classical control with quantum algorithms. A few of those languages we saw are starting to get, well, some of them do it, some others are starting to get there. Okay. So that's not the only problem. There's of course like basically a binder full of problems. Uh, some very fun ones that I think are fun for the Haskell community to think about is like unit testing is not only hard, but it's probably computationally infeasible to kind of run your algorithm on a classical computer then know that it's going to work on a quantum computer because this is a whole point. We're building quantum computers because classical computers can't run these algorithms, let's suppose. We certainly have this issue of like our types not quite capturing our meaning still. Um, maybe we want to like squish more meaning in there. Um, there's probably others, okay? Definitely others. But one that I just kind of want to, um, if you will, chat to you about a little bit, just because I think it's real fun, is uh, what, I, what I'll call type level entanglement. So let's go back to this bell state, this entangled state. And let's just think a little bit about our function f here. Now, if we are good functional programmers, we can think to ourselves, oh, this is, this is very exciting. We know that the first argument of f qubit a and the second argument of f are totally disconnected, right? This is kind of like the promise of um, pure functional programming. Like these two things should be totally disconnected. Uh, they shouldn't be able to influence each other at all. We actually saw an example showing that at the very least they're correlated. Um, and if I were to prove to you that they're entangled, then we would see they, they do have this influence relationship. Um, so this is like very stressful, right? To the functional programmer. Um, maybe Einstein uh, was also a fan of functional programming, okay? Because he really hated this fact about quantum computing. He called it spooky, sorry, quantum mechanics. He called it spooky action at a distance. So this, this is terrible, right? We're very scared, but actually maybe this is great, right? Because maybe there's heaps of fun things we could do um, to do a bit more work here. So I just kind of want to like maybe throw this API at you for consideration. And so what I could do is I could kind of use a little bit more richer Haskell type theory to try and encode entangled types and non-entangled non things as different types. Um, and this is how it might look. This is just one idea. There's many, many issues with this representation. One of them that's kind of fun to mention is the idea that look at line one and line two. I can just tell you that if I was a, if I was to comment out either line one or line two, then operation two, which up here I've defined as being entangled, would not be entangled. So the question is like, how can we define a type system that would let us capture that? Uh, power, well, great news, uh, two or three days ago, these people did that, <laughs> very exciting, um, in, in, a, in, a, in a very cool way. So it's worth, um, sorry, they've taken a quite a different approach to what I've outlined here. Uh, it's not in Haskell, but, it's, but it's, very, it's very cool. So if you're excited about that, like that's worth, that's worth checking out. And there's, there's a lot more to chat about here. It's actually a really, really rich area, but I just wanna kind of, come to the conclusion. Um, and so I just kind of want to talk about like, where is the quantum industry presently? Okay, it's in this yellow part, the NISC part. But I want to talk about all these areas. So we kind of had the up and, you know, until recently we had what I might call the before Shaw time. So Shaw has this famous factoring algorithm for um, working out the factors of a large composite number such as 15. So before, sure, maybe we never knew what how to factor 15. We have the lambda calculus, you know, but we were really struggling with like optimization problems such as how to get from A to B. So it was a horrible time. In the NISC era, this kind of regime where you have what they call noisy quantum computers. Okay, it's, it's, it's a, it could be characterized by funding. Okay, it's certainly characterized by engineering. Um, we don't have what people would call full error correction. The question is like, can we do something? Okay, 
um, actually is not totally clear yet. <laughs> I think people are trying really, really, really hard to show that there is something to do. Um, I up for grabs. Um, the time that we really want to get to is what I'll call the quantum Turing time, or what people call kind of like fault tolerant quantum computing or you know, universal quantum computation. And this time is very exciting, right? We can finally factor 15, maybe we have like the quantum lambda calculus. Um, that movie Sneakers becomes true. We can kind of break RSA encryption as we wish. Um, I think we can also, yeah, maybe uh, graph isomorphism. We can do something about that, not too sure. Could be wrong, but what's exciting about that is that qubits live for as long as we like. Okay, life is very, very good, but we're not there yet. Okay, um, and so I just want to also give you just a little bit of a feeling for like, well, in this NISC era, what does the world look like? Well, what it looks like is like you you go around to a quantum computer and you count how many qubits does that have. Okay, it's a little bit more complicated than that, but that's the gist. And so this, this video by IBM is actually really worth watching if you're interested in the practicalities of um, how IBM is coming up with this plan. Uh, IonQ is another company with kind of uh, dreams of, of getting larger and larger qubits. And there's a quite a famous company in the quantum computing world, PsiQuantum. Uh, I'm not totally sure if they have a date that they've promised a million qubits, but they, I think that's the main thing you see on their homepage is one million qubits. Um, it occasionally reminds me of the 1 million pixels website, if anyone remembers that classic. So I just want to give you some feel for the numbers of, of qubits you need to do some things. So like maybe 20 million to factor a big RSA number. Um, maybe you need 6,000 error corrected qubits, you know, 3 billion gates, something I haven't talked about, but quantum computers are not only constrained about that by the number of qubits, but they're also constrained by how many steps of an algorithm you can run. Okay, certainly in the NISC era. Um, apparently, according to this recent paper, it's 35 million qubits to break Bitcoin. And chemistry, kind of these, chemistry is one of maybe the leading applications of quantum computing. And, and I think for interesting applications, that's maybe in the millions of qubits. Don't quote me on that, but you can at least have a look at that reference. They talk about the number of logical qubits. Um, okay, so yeah, we're basically at the end now. I just kind of want to give you a sense for like quantum Haskell, like yes or no, okay? There's pros and cons. Um, one is like type safety. We love type safety, right? Haskell has this really nice community and this really great ecosystem. This is very exciting. It suddenly has the rich type theory. But I think one thing that I maybe haven't focused on, but actually Haskell also has really, really great compilation tooling. Okay, and lots of people out in the world are reusing this compilation uh, ability to do other cool things with languages. So this is really worth something that this is really worth not forgetting about. But on the no side, it's kind of like Python is standard. Okay, hardware story, I think it's to think about. I actually got quite inspired watching uh, the Clash talk earlier today. I was thinking like, yeah, the hardware story about Haskell is really cool actually, you know. Um, so there's lots to chat about there. I think it's actually really cool. But one of the downsides is like, well, we don't want to use Haskell to just write yet another uh, kind of domain specific language that doesn't get, that isn't kind of practical. And maybe like a philosophical question is like, what do quantum algorithm people even want to use to do programming anyway? Um, so that's it. That's, that's my talk. I work at Twig. You can find me um, on those links. And yeah, we're just really interested in this area. So um, come and have a chat if you are as well. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Noon. Uh, there are a couple of uh, questions on Discord. Uh, if you want to go through them on the stream, it's fine because it's lunch break anyway after this. I'm out. I don't have um, Discord open. Yeah, OK. So uh, Mark Dominus uh, asks, I guess the type error here corresponds to some operation that is physically impossible, but I don't understand why it would be physically impossible to allocate a qubit and not return it. What's the physical analog here? Oh, I guess it's not physically impossible, right? You could you could certainly do that. Um, you could certainly you could certainly do that. Yeah, but isn't it great that our type system would warn us? Maybe you're arguing that you don't want the type system to warn us about that because it's a physically plausible operation. Yeah, 
we could probably chat about that later. But I, but I think I like the idea that it captures the intention. There'd be something to chat about there about the physicality of, of doing that. Thanks for the question. In X example two, does H not have a linear type encoded in the signature? Is that why we were able to use A as an argument to H as well as uh, C naught? No, I think H definitely had a linear type with any luck. Um, maybe I did something a little bit sneaky, which is I used the same variable name uh, a few times. So this A kind of overwrites that A. Um, but I can just show you, I think in the monadic API with any luck, H has uh, a linear constraint on its argument. Thanks for the question. Uh, Gergo already asks, uh, is the set of entangled qubits by a quantum computer programming uh, program monotonically increasing until the final sampling? Or are there entanglement destroying operations? Yes, 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 indeed, indeed. Excellent, excellent question. I'm going to open up this file. <laughs> so there's certainly, there's certainly, uh, certainly you can increase and decrease entanglement as you go. And actually, kind of one of the cool, one of the quirks of entanglement that I didn't talk about is entanglement actually, it's, it, I don't think it's okay to think of it as discrete, either entangled or not. You might need like a continuous variable to represent how entangled two qubits are. But then as I've kind of rambled some comments in the code here, if you want to glance, this is this is basically problematic if you want to do that. But thanks for the question. Uh, I'm not sure if this is a follow-up for that. Uh, Sasha, the trivial says uh, that suggests maybe you'd want a fine type since we have linear types and uh, SCLV say agrees that uh, fine types have been used in some quantum languages. Yes, good comments. I will probably ask those two people to explain to me what affine types are. So, right. but thank you. Uh, there's some follow-up discussion about the time independence thing. Uh, Phil Armstrong said, uh, I think the chain of reasoning is associativity of a unitary operator implies linearity, which in turn implies a bunch of conversational uh, conservation loss for the Hilbert space, including the conservation of energy which by no other's theorem is associated with time independence. Not sure about that middle step though. Yes, great comment slash question. I believe the theorem relating uh, time independence and that unitary thing is called Stone's theorem. I'll post a link um, somewhere, but yeah, great comment. It's certainly related to conservation of energy. I believe that part is true. Yeah, very right, nice. uh, yeah, SCLV posted a link saying that it's simpler than that probably, but uh, uh, yeah, it's hard to uh, describe it here. You should probably check this out later. <laughs> okay, great. All right, uh, let's go to the Q&A, guys and cool. girls Thanks. and pets.